All right, um, let me go and get started. I uh, haven't had anybody uh, join live here, but I had a couple of questions on email. So I had one or two things um, that I'll go over here and I'll post this later for people to look at. So uh, hopefully I got everything set up correctly here. Um, so we are on our week three, unit three. So you should be working on your third assignment, which is about um, using dynamic memory allocation for a large integer class. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about dynamic memory allocation versus automatic and static memory allocation. Uh, and maybe also show the debugger and then, I'll, and then like I uh, promised last time, talk uh, in a little bit more detail about the add function. Um, so. Um, so I've already got my dev box running here. Um, let me, um, let me review, because I've, I've also had some questions about, um, you know, getting the um, uh, code formatter working. So let me review that again. So again, to check if your code formatter is working, um, an easy way to check it is to just try and format some code. So, you know, um, all right, so if you put it on all in a line with no spaces, no blanks, um, you know, it should be formatted um, when you save. So it should be running our, uh, our class style checker um, and formatter, right? So, so you should see the parentheses go on their own line of their own. There should be space after keywords like if and for and while before the opening um, um, parentheses. There should be white space before and after binary operators like um, uh, Boolean equals or assignments. Um, and so on. So that's, that's an easy way to check, okay? So some things, if that's not working, um, I mean, you should check, um, open up a terminal and make certain that you've run configure on your project. It doesn't hurt to, to run it um, if you've already run it before. So if we do like terminal new terminal, um, you have to do this for every one of your assignments before you start on it. So that should, um, uh, set the configuration. When that's run, you should see in every one of your projects, you should have a VS Code directory, which has these uh, JSON files, which basically has the configuration for the Visual Studio Code server here. Right? You should also have a CLang format file, which defines the class style file for the formatter. Okay? Um, and the other thing is um, for the formatting to work, you do have to have the, IntelliS the correct IntelliSense installed. So if you looked at, at your extensions, you should see that you have the C, C++ uh, IntelliSense extension installed and um, it should be working. So it should say that um, the extension is enabled globally um, and you should see that you've got version 1.5.1 if you're using the same um, class dev box that um, I created for you guys for this class here. So. All right. Um, So since we're talking about dynamic memory allocation, um, I wanted to remove that here. So um, I just wanted to kind of quickly talk about um, the types of uh, how, how you can allocate memory in a program like C or, or C++ in a, in a programming language like C or C++. Um, of course, this isn't specific to C, C++, so, so you can do the same things in pretty much any language, although some languages hide from you the ability to dynamically allocate memory and some languages manage memory for you instead of you having to kind of manage your memory a little bit. Um, so, so C, the, the ability to, to manage and allocate your own memory is a powerful thing. So it, it gives you performance uh, improvements and, and possible benefits in terms of performance um, in space and time doing your own memory management, but it is, it is dangerous. So it is a, um, um, uh, an advanced kind of thing. It's very easy to mess up, right? So, so even very experienced programmers like me uh, mess up memory management and dynamic memory allocation all the time. Um, and there's all kinds of tools for trying to automatically check your memory management and memory allocations that they're correct or not, so, which are which are typically run for any project that's beyond like a medium size. So. 
So um, let's look at the, the large integer.cpp file. So um, when you create um, a program and you write functions, so, so I'll just mostly be talking about member functions here. Um, So um, I'm probably just gonna have to, to make some examples. So, so maybe, oh, I know, so I'll go to my two string function here. So whenever you have a function that you call um, and whenever you either pass in parameters to the function, so, so I'm not passing any parameters here, but um, um, if we had a function, um, like we passed in an integer parameter or whenever you declare a, a variable that's local to the function, these variables are um, allocated um, um, what are known as automatically. So they're, they're allocated on the function call stack. So, so, so automatic variables like this are only um, valid for the lifetime of the function, okay? So when you come into the function, these variables are created um, on uh, a special part of memory, the, the function call stack. Um, so you'll have a variable on the function call stack that's, that's pushed on the function call stack to hold the variable X for the parameter and any and all parameters will, will have some space allocated on the function call stack every time you call to string. And then any um, local variables that you create like this are gonna be um, allocated automatically or allocated on the stack, okay? So this is called automatic allocation or stack allocation, right? And when the function returns, this automatic allocation um, goes away, right? So it's only valid for the life of the function. So this has to do with a function scope, which is something that we talked about in a video on like the first week. So we reviewed a little bit about um, the, 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 the scope of variables. So when they're valid, when, when they have, when their lifetime is, right? So any variable that's passed in as a parameter or um, declared inside of a function is only valid for the loaf of that for the life of that function so, so it has a scope limited to that function and, and it does that by allocating it on the function call stack like i talked about okay so this is important um so um in a week or two we're going to start talking about recursion right in order to support recursive function a recursive function is a function that calls itself right so if you have a function that can call itself the problem with that is that um, you know the second time I call the function, I need another allocation of all of its local variables. You know, it's it's uh, variables that are declared in the function and of all the parameters, right? So I mean that's why there's this thing called the function call stack to support uh, recursive functions like that. Because a function, if you want to allow a function to be able to call itself, um, you need to be able to you need to always dynamically. Well, not, I shouldn't say dynamically because I don't want to confuse you, but you need to all always automatically allocate new space for all parameters and variables that are you know, alive in the scope of that function call, all right? So that, that's automatic allocation. Um, I've been sometimes sloppily calling the static allocation, that, that's technically incorrect. So, so another way you can allocate um, memory is, or yeah, variables is um, if you, declare a variable, a global variable. Again, we talked a little bit about this, at least about the lifetime of variables like this, when we talked about scope um, in a video in our first week here. But um, if we have a variable, I should use um, camel case notation to conform the class style there. Um, this variable is, is allocated statically. So what that means is that um, um, it, it's not, inside of a function. So um, it has a lifetime uh, for the life of the whole program, right? So as long as this program is running, um, my global variable will be uh, allocated somewhere statically um, and you'll be able to reference it um, and you know write values into it and read values out of it, okay? So a static variable is, is declared um, in the global database, so it's not declared inside of any function um, and it has a lifetime of of the program, right? So it, it's created statically when before the program starts um, and all while the program is running, you can access, you know, change or read or write statically uh, declared variables like this, all right? Now, uh, then the third type of memory is dynamically allocated memory, all right? So dynamically allocated memory, um, 
In C++, you should always use the new keyword to dynamically allocate memory, like we talked about in our videos this week. And you should always use delete to um, deallocate dynamically allocated memory once you're done using it. Okay. So this is an example of dynamically allocated memory um, in C++. If you're using plain C, there's other uh, uh, functions. So you use alloc or malloc to allocate memory dynamically, and you use uh, free to free up dynamically allocated memory. Okay? But if you're doing C++ programming like we're doing for this class, you should always use new and delete. Okay? So this, this allocates memory um, um, not on the function call stack, and it's not allocated statically. So some stuff that's allocated statically is part of the uh, the image of the program, uh, the executable. So the compiler will actually set aside some space in the uh, the executable image when it creates the .exe file, so that when it's loaded, that memory is set aside for statically uh, allocated variables to be used. Right. So dynamically allocated memory is allocated on the heap. All right. So so it's not available when the first when the program first starts running so it's not available until you dynamically allocate it by by uh, invoking new to dyna to dynamically allocate some memory right and and it can go away before the program is done running because you can delete it so you can free it back up right um, and it's allocated on the structure called a heap um, because uh, th this is a data structure a, a type a, a data type we'll talk a little bit about when we talk about um, 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 stacks um, and queues um, and things. So, so a heap is a special type of a, um, um, uh, like a stack or a queue um, for um, organizing um, items. So we'll, come, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So you don't, don't have to really understand why it's a heap. Just it, it's another separate uh, thing that the operating system manages. So every program has a function call stack Every program has a heap and every program has memory allocated to it when the image is first loaded to start running the program um, in which statically allocated uh, variables of memory will reside. All right. So, you know, it, it's good to be clear about uh, about those three kinds of things and, and to know, you know, so if um, and I'll talk more about this when I talk about the add function here, but um, um, now that we've you've learned about dynamically allocating memory um, and using pointers and things, um, um, it, it's time to understand what the difference is between allocating something uh, automatically um, on, the, um, uh, on the stack. Um, I'm going to remove this so that I don't have a compiler error. So, uh, uh, allocating things automatically um, on the stack every time you call a function, you know, either uh, variables inside the function or parameters you pass in the function or allocated automatically. Um, allocating things um, statically, um, so they're global, basically. Um, they're, they're always available while the program is running. And then dynamic allocation that happens on the, uh, the, the uh, program heap um, that you can create at any time and it will stay valid uh, until you explicitly free it up somewhere else. So every new call should have a corresponding delete call. You know, so you should allocate it and somewhere you really should be deleting it. So in our program here where we're allocating the digits array dynamically, it gets freed up because the class constructor gets called whenever this class um, um, is destroyed. And if you look at the class destructor um, here, you'll see that we call delete on the digit array, right? Um, okay. So that was dynamic memory allocation. Um, and uh, I already talked a little bit again about um, getting your code style formatting things working. Um, oh, I wanted to, uh, so some people have been asking about uh, running the debugger, um, so I thought maybe I would show that as well. So sometimes um, you'll run into a problem that's tough enough that, that you would, you know, you, you can't really debug it by putting in some print statement or C out statements um, in, in the case of C++. Um, and, and you'd really like to run your sy symbolic debugger. We've got that set up to run um, in your Visual Studio code, but it doesn't run very well. Um, um, 
you can't really do it by setting a breakpoint in the um, uh, the unit path. So if you do that, I mean, you can do that. Let me, let me go and try it. So control shift one. Um, Uh, and we'll rebuild everything, um, make certain my tests are still running, so my tests are still running. Um, and if you run the debugger, oh, uh, by default, I think though that that um, if, if you run it from here, it's gonna launch, it's gonna run the main executable instead of the test executable. Um, so this probably won't run by our default um, setup. You know, so when you do the configure, it configures things like, like the um, how, uh, how you launch a debug session, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, by, by default, if you run the debugger, it actually runs the, uh, the main, it's not running the test executable, it's running the main executable. So remember, um, I've, I've briefly talked about these before here. So if you look at, um, let me stop that debug session here so we can stop it by doing that. Um, So, you know, whenever you build, we're actually building two executables um, in our project. So we build a, a test executable, which uses the, um, the test file to run these unit tests, right? But we also build a, a debug executable, um, which is built from the, the main.cpp uh, function and is linked together with the other files in the project. Um, and this is meant to be used for debugging, okay? Um, So I, I, I could actually modify the configuration on here. This is something that um, I wouldn't recommend people do, but um, if you go to, um, is it launch, I think. Um, so in here in the launch.json, there's the configuration for the launching the debug session. And by default, it's gonna, um, the, the program is gonna run is that debug executable. Um, so, so you could try changing it to the test executable and saving that. Um, and um, I, to be safe, I probably have to reload my configuration. So I'll just uh, reload Visual Studio Code by just reloading the, reloading the browser tab. So I think now um, by default, if I launch a debug session, it'll run the, the test executable. And, that, and since I have a breakpoint here, it should break here when, when we try and run in the debugger. Okay. Um, So, yeah. So yeah, what you'll see if you do that is um, um, it stops. It, it it's th this debugger is configured to stop at the very first um, line uh, in the main function. So if we're running the test um, executable, um, it uses its own main function that's defined by our catch uh, framework. So you, you'll see you're in this kind of weird main function here. But yeah, we set a breakpoint. So I can go ahead and just uh, uh, continue. It should continue on and hit that breakpoint, hopefully. So yeah, so now we're here. Um, and the, the main problem is it's kind of tough to step into these, right? Um, um, so if, if you step into here, it's not actually going to step into your function. It's going to step into the, the catch uh, unit test framework uh, thing. So we can try that. So like we try to step um, into this here. So up here are the, the things for stepping over, stepping into, stepping back out, um, oh, restarting. Um, but yeah, if you step into here, you're not gonna actually get into the, the two string function. Um, so we're in the framework um, for doing the, um, uh, here, when you look at the, the call stack here, so, so the call stack is going to look pretty messy here, but um, um, but, but yeah, there was what I was, so there's what we're trying to do here. We could try and set a, a breakpoint into string, but of course, there's multiple calls to two string, but I'll go ahead and do that and continue on. So, I mean, you, you can kind of do this if you understand what's going on, but you'll get some messy stuff. So because we're using the unit test framework, 
um, it, it's it's easy to kind of get lost in um, all the, the macros and things that the unit test framework um, uses. So, um, but we could set a breakpoint in um, our two string member function. Let's say I want to break uh, here as soon as I enter. And we could continue on. Uh, and then we're here. So, so now we're in our two string function on our call stack here. And I could step over that. Um, and we should have a, a large integer string, O string string variable, and so on. Okay. But um, let, let me show you kind of the way that, that um, let me go ahead and stop that. So yeah, so so um, to make it, I don't know if this is easy or not, but um, by default we're we're using the the, the debug executable um, in our configuration here. So let me change that back, um, and reload. So the way this is meant to be used, uh, the debugger, if, if if you need to debug a, a function, um, you'll have to modify the main. Um, .cpp file uh, to add in some code that you want to debug. So let's say that I want to debug that two string. That's the only function I've really got implemented so far. So um, um, I could do something kind of like this suggestion here. Um, I could uh, create a large integer. With 10 digits. Um, I usually copy and paste this from the test that I want to debug or something like that. Basically, I'm doing that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if we, if we wanted to de debug the two string method, um, I could call the two string method. So, so now um, we're just directly calling two string. We're, we're expecting two string should return back, you know, the string. Um, this is the uh, least significant digit, so you have to kind of reverse these. So it's gonna, it should return back um, the string 214748-3648 um, in this case here. Oh, uh, so this is large integer. I'm just going to call it large integer. Integer one. Um, all right. So, so yeah, I mean, you do first have to put in a little bit of code to, to set up stuff that you want to debug. Uh, but but yeah, this is this is built as part of the normal build system. So if I rebuild Control Shift Two, um, it should rebuild my my main function. Um, so that should be called digits one. Or check to make certain that it really does uh, rebuild the debug. You know the, the, the code that you just did uh, rebuilds the main function and then um, links together your debug executable, and then you should be able to run. And you don't have to set any breakpoints because um, um, here, it, so if you're running in the debug executable, this is the main function, so it'll, it'll automatically stop at the very first line, right? So um, let's go ahead and oops, and run the debugger, launch it. All right, so now we're, we're in our debug session. So, notice, um, so I'm going to point out a couple of things. We were just talking about the function call stack. So when you start running the program, it pushes um, um, a frame, let's call it a, a frame, on the function call stack. So basically, it pushes a frame to hold all of our local variables, uh, argc and argv, which are the parameters to main. And also, there's the digit ones variable, the large integer one variable. We haven't actually uh, constructed these yet, um, argc and argv, right? So these are all local. So these are all automatically allocated onto the, 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 the function call stack, right? And then down here is the view of where we're, our, where we're at on the function call stack. So we can um, step over to actually create our digits. So now we should see that we've got these values and our digits here. Um, again, this is an automatic variable on our function call stack for our main function. Um, so we'll create the large integer object. Uh, so after we construct this, it ought to get the number of digits to 10 um, and so on. Huh. 
I was expecting that to update after we did that, so I'm not certain why. But anyway, so so now we're at this line. So let's let's step in. So if we step in here, uh, we should step into the two string function. So now we're in two string. So notice now our call stack because we started in main and main called two string in the large integer class. So we called large integer two string method. And that's where we're at. And, and, and uh, you can change up and down the call stack by clicking here. So we can go back to the main function and see the automatic variables, you know, the stack variables um, on our main function down here, and go back into our two string. Um, and then, you know, you can use your normal thing. So we can step through here to, to debug um, this code here. Um, you can look at the values of your um, variables here, um, and you can actually use the, the terminal. This is a full GNU debugger, so you can use um, um, uh, um, the, the GNU debugger command line if you have to, although it's a little bit, um, you have to use the dash exec in front of each command. So if I want to print out the value of, um, I don't have anything to print out, but uh, I can try printing out large and see if I get anything to do that. So, um, um, so but they, uh, of course, normally, if you're just looking at the values of variables, you can use the the, the GUI to um, um, uh, look at those values. But, but this is pretty powerful because we are using the full GNU debugger. So um, if you have to, you can go down here and dump out raw memory and, and um, uh, get into your registers and actually decompile code and, and whatever you might need to do, right? But but usually, most people, you know, usually you don't have to, to get into those. I mean, it's all you really need are the step over, step into, uh, being able to set and remove breakpoints, um, and then be able, able to examine the, the the values of the variables as you're stepping through things. Um. All right, so that is the debugger. When, when you're done with the debugger, you can just stop it. Um, All right, let's move that breakpoint. All right, and then the final thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the last task. So I, I, I talked about the um, um, task one through five quite a bit on Tuesday, uh, but I went quickly through kind of tasks four and five um, and six. Or, um, didn't, didn't say a whole lot about six, basically. So, um, so I think for most people should find it relatively easy. It, it's it's basically just adding, just accessing your digit array uh, with um, an extra check. So so basically we're doing some um, um, checking the bounds, right? So if you ask for a digit that's beyond the the bounds of your digit array, you should return zero. Or if you ask for a negative digit, which would uh, indicate a fractional part. So we're not really supporting um, floating point or fractional numbers here. So a negative digit should always return zero um, as well, negative exponents. Um, and the pin digit, um, so I mentioned last time, I mean, this is gonna be a little bit tricky. And so you, you, you again, you have to practice memory management for a pin digit, right? So, so you have to allocate a new array of digits uh, you know, because we're adding one more digit. So the, the current array of digits that you have um, is not big enough to append another digit. So you first have to allocate a new array. You have to copy the old digits from that array to the new array of digits. Uh, and, that, and, and the new array, of course, has to be bigger uh, by one than the old array. Um, and then you can safely put the new digit uh, to the to the last index of this new array. So, so the new value um, to the end of the digit array. And then you know you need to you know so you are required to be good memory managers. So you have to make certain that you correctly free up by calling delete the old array of digits. And then you have to repoint your digit member variable. To the newly allocated space that's grown as either one. Okay, so again here, I mean, you know, we're mostly using digit in our large integer class as an array, but um, um, it's 
it's a pointer to the base address of the memory that's allocated uh, that, that we're going to be using as an array, right? So, um, so if we go to the header file, or enter.hpp, right? So, I mean, it, it is a pointer, right? So, if, if you allocate a new dynamic uh, array of variables, uh, call it like something like new digits, new digit, something like that, right? So, but, but both of those would be pointers then. Digit would be a pointer to somewhere in memory, a, a block of memory that's an array of digits, and new digit would be, would be a pointer to a different block of memory that's allocated on the heap, right? And then, so then when you're ready to switch over, you can just set, simply um, assign the pointer, the, the memory address that's being held by the digit, um, to, to, you know, assign new digits memory address, the base address for new digits into digit, right? So that, that's all you have to do for that, um, um, that step to repoint your digit array to that newly allocated space, right? So let's talk about add um, member function. Um, So again, I, I kind of gave a um, algorithm. So this class is about data structures and um, algorithms right here. So um, the reason why we implemented um, many of the functions that we did, so the reasons why we implemented the, you had to implement the constructor that you implemented and you had to implement the max digits member function. And the reason why you had to implement the append digit member function and the digit at position member function is all of those can be are used by the algorithm that that you need to implement for the add function, right? And and by having the, those those member functions, um, it makes the um, the algorithm for implementing add relatively straightforward. So it's so not trivial. So so, so you know um, um, you will have to work to understand this, but um, um, I mean you know basically. Um, we kind of had an example here. So basically, though, if you have two integers and you're adding like large integer two to, to large integer one, you have to by hand go through and, and add up the digits, right? Um, and and the way you should be doing that is you should start with the least significant digit and and uh, simulate carry. So remember doing um, addition a long addition by hand when you first learned it in grade school, right? So you start by adding up the, the ones digit in the index zero, three plus seven. That'll give you a result, and there might be a carry as well. So, so you end up with a new digit. So this could have been like three plus five. So you have that in that case, you have an eight with a carry of zero, right? But every one of these calculations can have a carry of one. So in this case, three plus seven, you end up with ten. So you end up with a zero, and you're carrying one over. And then you have two plus eight, which is ten plus one, the carry one. So, so you always have to add in the carry when you're doing this. Two plus eight plus one becomes. 11, so you end up with a one and a carry of one, and then you end up with 11 again, a one and a carry of one, right? So that is um, um, the, the step two, performing the addition from the least significant to the most significant, uh, keeping track of the carry. Um, and you're supposed to do that into a, a new dynamically allocated array that you do um, on here. So, uh, and then you're going to use your constructor that you created in step two um, to create a large integer object. Right, so you're going to pass in that array that you um, summed up by hand to create your large integer object. Right? Um, Now, some people miss this step because um, the, um, um, I'll just emphasize it here in this video. Um, the, the, the function takes in um, a, another large integer as a, as a parameter, and you're supposed to pass in that other large integer as a constant reference parameter, okay? So again, like we did for the previous assignment, whenever you're passing in an instance of an object to a member function, uh, we, we will normally be passing in it in as constant if we don't modify that object. So it should probably almost always be a constant parameter. 
but we pass in by reference, um, again, usually for performance reasons, right? So in this case, you know, we might have a large integer with, with a million digits, for example. If we pass it in by um, reference, or sorry, if we pass it in by value, that would imply that we need to make a copy of the object before we pass it in. So we'd have to make a, a copy of all those million digits, right? So that could be inefficient, right? So, so, so we're going to pass it in by reference, confidence of perfect trial. But the other thing, though, um, that, that, that people you know, miss, it's easy to miss, but um, is you need to, the re results, and those we're returning a result, a large integer result. I'm calling add this, this need to be a new large integer, but you need to return a reference to a large integer. All right. So, so you're not returning large integer, you're, you're returning a large integer reference as the return type. So, so you need to say large integer ampersand as your return type from the add function. Right? Um, and the reason why we do that, and, and then also in step three, people miss this as well. So, so you know, you shouldn't um, create large integer as a automatically created variable. You need to dynamically allocate a new large integer so that um, it's allocated on the heap, like I was just talking about, and it, it stays around. So, so you know, if if you allocate this um, automatically um, as as a regular variable inside of the add function, uh, that that variable will go away when you return. But you need to return that back to the caller. So you have to that allocate this dynamically and then return that reference um, to that new dynamically allocated object back to the caller so that the caller has that actual new object reference that it can use right so yeah i mean you know be careful about this but again this is this is kind of the point of this whole unit here is understanding dynamic memory allocation and becoming comfortable with, with doing things like this you know so, so here you need to use the new keyword to dynamically allocate a large integer um, and you're going to be returning that reference um, um, as your result from the add function. Okay. And then finally, um, so like in this example, you could end up to having a carry out of the very last, um, you know, when you add the most significant digits of your two values. So, so in, in, and we had that in this case, we had a carry of one. So the re result, result should be like one, 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 zero here, right? So it, the, the, the result grew in size from three digits to four digits, right? So that's where the append digit is supposed to come into. So if you do have a carry, um, um, you should just call append digit on your carry uh, value, and that will append it to become the new most significant digit to that uh, large integer that you just dynamically created, right? All right, um, so that's it for this uh, session. I'll post this video here. Um, hopefully people, that'll be helpful for people to better understand the add function and understand dynamic memory allocation and versus automatic and static memory allocation. Um, all right, so if you have questions, email me them um, or use GitHub to put comments on GitHub. Um, and um, yeah, keep working on assignment three and I'll see you guys later then.